Okay, now for the first talk in the night shift, basically it's uh, encrypted DNS, the the good, bad, and ugly of DNS over HTTPS, and Sebastian is going to talk about that and all aspects of it. Please give him a warm welcome. Könnt ihr das Licht noch runterdrehen? Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Sebastian. Um, just a, a small heads up. The subtitle is actually borrowed by Daniel Stanberg. Uh, Daniel is the author of Curl. Um, uh, thanks, Daniel, for your title. Um, I work for a German-speaking online IT news magazine. Name doesn't matter. Um, part of my work was going to the IATF meeting. So for those people who don't know, the IATF is the Internet Engineering Task Force. Those are the people who actually work on the protocols that make up the Internet. So whenever there's an IATF standard, um, that is what the Internet actually is. Um, at the IATF 99 in Prague, um, there was a so-called dispatch. So some developer comes up with a new idea um, and asks the IATF if they want to work on their idea or not. Um, They wanted to work on it. Um, that protocol was called DNS over HTTPS, and it was dispatched in its own working group. So there were people that worked just on that protocol. Um, and I'm going to tell you why they worked on DNS over HTTPS. Um, so I have to actually read, read this for you, because it's maybe a bit too small for a slide. So in the middle, you can see Eric Rescara. He's the CTO of Firefox for Mozilla. So he's doing all the technical bits for Firefox. Um, and he was explaining uh, DOH to some people in an audience, just like I do now. Um, on Twitter, somebody then said, the right answer is that everyone should be running a feature-complete caching and forwarding resolver on localhost. All the rest of these discussions are noise from companies that want eyeballs. Um, yeah, so for those of you who may not know actually any of those words. You're the actual target audience of DOH. Um, for all the others, well, you may learn something about DNS as well. Um, that's what I'm here for. Um, so in the beginning, there was no DNS. Um, as we all know, computers talk to each other via IP. The thing is, um, how do you map an IP address to an actual machine? Well, it's kind of hard. You all may know that there's an etc slash hosts file on your device. Um, basically, any operating system out there has this file. Um, with DNS, that file is actually not necessary, but we still use it. And first file, uh, first host file is like 40 years old. Um, and this was used before the internet actually existed in the ARPANET. They had a few problems with that. Um, at each node of the ARPANET, they had to manually maintain the hosts file. And in order to sync them, they had to phone them. They had to actually send letters to each other in order to sync the names for other IP addresses and computers. That didn't work out quite well, so they ended up with a lot of different names for the same computers, which is basically a clusterfuck, and you don't really want this. Um, so after 15 years and with the growing ARPANET, they came up with an idea, which we now know as DNS. Um, the basic idea is to automate the mapping of an IP to domain names, or vice versa. So if a client asks for an IP uh, of a domain, some server answers and gives you the IP address. That's still how um, DNS resolution, resol resolution now works. Nothing changed um, in this idea for the last 30 years. Um, so they, before they actually started on the technical bits, they started um, working on the idea of how should our system work. Basic idea is you've got a worldwide global hierarchy where you put all your domain names into it. Then you've got decentralized servers, thousands of servers that take care of that hierarchy. Um, in order to do this, you need standards. So any single server in that um, system needs to speak the same language in order for this system to work. Um, it took them like five or six years to actually standardize that kind of system. This was in November 1987. And we still use this system today. 
Like, this is one of the oldest protocols you still use daily, heavily daily. This is what the hierarchy in the original standard looks like. So you may see there's a, a top node on it, and then you've got a tree. That tree goes into different top-level domains, mil.edu.apa. Like, more than 30 years ago, there were not that many TLDs. Um, and then it gets split down, and each um, branching node um, may be what you now know as a name server, or it may not be. But that's the important thing. We've got still this like tree hierarchy in DNS today. So how does this work? So let's take a look at uh, events.ccc.de for this event. If you want to know the IP address of that domain, you ask root servers, the top node in the tree hierarchy, okay, which server is responsible for the .de TLD? Then you get an answer. With this, you go a step a little further. In case of the .de TLD, the people responsible for this is the DENIC. You may know them. Um, and you ask their servers, okay, who in your zone, .de, is responsible for ccc.de? You get an answer. And then you do this as well with the name servers from the uh, Cars Com Computer Club, and you get an answer. Um, just to give you a picture how this works, that top uh, node in the hierarchy, the root servers, um, there are more than 1,000 physical servers um, out there to work with the daily DNS. Without those servers, nothing at all would work. Um, so, as I explained, you go, you traverse the tree top down, um, but that's not actually how it works. You make it recursive. Um, and at each point in the tree where it's branching, you can actually cache previously seen IP addresses. This is what we call a cached resolving process, if you remember the slide with the tree um, in the beginning. This may be important for the actual DOH employment, uh, deployment. Then there are stuff resolvers. So these asking several different servers and traversing this tree doesn't actually happen on your device. Um, what's happening on your device is called a stub resolver because it actually is not doing anything for real. Um, it still works that way that you ask your stub resolver for an IP address and you get that. But the sub resolver just forwards your uh, request to an actual recursive resolver. From that, the sub resolver gets the actual answer for the IP address. Um, and this is what ends up in your operating system and what the clients on your OS actually use. Um, so how do they talk to each other, all those thousands of servers worldwide? Well, as I said, they first came up with the idea of the DNS, and then they worked on the technical bits. These are actually two different standards. So RFC 1034 is the idea, the description of how the DNS works. RFC 1035 is the technical bits. How do we work on the wire with that system so they all know and understand what you're actually talking about? Um, one of the uh, most important things is that only a specific um, name servers are, well, authoritative name servers for specific parts of the domain, like the root servers for all the top-level domains. Um, and you can split this out. And remember the tree from the hierarchy? Um, you can actually draw circles for each name server in those branches. Um, and this is a DNS zone that's going to be important in the next slides. Um, each of those zones has so-called resource records. They are more or less a database with um, a lot of info on the actual DNS in them. So domain names, IP addresses, a lot of other different things on how uh, the DNS actually works. Some of them are really, really important, like which mail server belongs to a specific domain. Because um, 
you can just run a mail server on ccc.de, for example. But this would be a different server than the web server on ccc.de. Um, and you can actually differentiate them on the level of DNS. And you make this with the resource records. Uh, those resor resource records um, have an encoding representation. So they are not text files. So whenever you ask your stub resolver or an, any other resolver, ask any other DNS server, they are not sending text like an HTTP. They're sending an hex, uh, an, an binary encoded, uh, not an octet encoded um, message. Um, each resource record has specifics um, on how you encode those resource records into an octet. That's all in 1035. So if you ever want to uh, have a well, week-long project, if you're on holidays, you can actually implement this. There are a lot of tutorials to do this. It's not that hard. The uh, curl code, like the C code for curl to implement uh, RFC 1034 is like 700 lines or so. So it's not that hard. It's doable. Um, and the most important thing for the rest of my talk is... Um, all those uh, bits and pieces that are going thrown around in the internet are done um, on port 53 and complete in plain text via UDP. That's why it's now called DO53, because it's on port 53. Before, uh, just a few years ago, that was DNS, but DNS has changed. So we had to find, well, a new name for the old school DNS and the, well, new school DNS. As I said, it's completely unencrypted. Everything is in plain text. Uh, there is no authentication at all. They never thought, when they, when they made DNS, they never thought that you would have billions of people in the internet. So whenever you ask a name server, you are not, you, there is no way for you to be sure that you're actually talking to the server you wanted to talk to. There is no authentication at all. So with this, uh, DNS over port 53 can be tracked. So any man in the middle knows or can know um, what domains you're asking the IP address for. Um, it can be blocked. Just block port 53 and none of your DNS will ever work. Um, you can manipulate anything that runs over this. So you can just, um, if you're a man in the middle and there's no authentication, you can just send bogus answers. Um, and you can actually redirect um, requests on, on DNS over port 53. So I ask the name server of the CCC, but the man in the middle points me to a rogue name server and gives me a different IP address, which works quite easily because there is no authentication at all. Um, it gets uglier. Um, so these kind of, well, non-features are actually used now by people as features. So for the last 30 years, a lot of admins uh, got used to be able to do this. So they are now using the unauthenticated uh, bullshit of DNS over port 53 um, to make what most people call supervision. So they filter out your requests on a block level. Um, Hijacking is actually, what I find really funny is hijacking, like redirecting you to a different page, um, is used as a feature worldwide in a captive portal. Whenever you enter um, a public Wi-Fi, you have to accept um, some, some terms and conditions. Um, you may have recognized that those kind of portal pages don't come up if you use an HTTPS connection. Because if you use HTTPS, the server you want to talk to is actually authenticated, but if the provider of the access point with the name server that you want to talk to um, tries to redirect you on the captive portal page, there's a mismatch, so you can't access the login page for the public Wi-Fi. That's because they fuck up DNS. Um, side note, there's actually an IETF working group that works on fixing this. So they're working on a protocol to make this work. Um, Google kind of slipped around this. They have just a uh, probing URL in Android. Whenever you um, access a public Wi-Fi, 
Android probes this public URL, and then you get redirected. You can also do this with neverssl.com. Highly recommend. Um, so as I said, DNS is uh, kind of strange and is used um, in, well, not that good of ways. So in the end of, of the 1990s, a lot of people um, saw that the unauthenticated part of DNS is going to be a problem. So they came up with what we now know as DNSSEC. DNSSEC stands for Domain Name System Security Extensions. Um, the name extensions is because they just add new resource records to the old ones. So it should be um, compatible to the old standard. Um, the idea is that you sign zones with a key. So each root server zone um, is signed with a key. And then you can, with this, you can traverse the uh, tree in the hierarchy and add signatures to those new zones for any single name server zone. With this, you can actually authenticate the name server you're talking to. So the answer you get from those name server you can trust is tamper-proof. Problem is, it's still unencrypted. So whenever you use DNSSEC, um, people on the wire can still see what you are requesting. They are not able to manipulate your route. They are not able to manipulate the answer. You still get the correct IP address. But do you really want your employer to know that you're serving Pornhub in your free time? Hmm, maybe not. Um, there are other problems with DNSSEC. So it's really, really hard to deploy, it turns out. Um, it's hard to tell how many servers actually use DNSSEC but current estimate is just between 15 and 20% of all the name servers out there actually use DNSSEC. And they had 20 years of time. So that may not be a viable solution to actually make DNSSEC tamper-proof, uh, DNS tamper-proof. Um, and as I said, you've got stub resolvers that don't actually use any resolving, um, but they just refer you to another name server on your uh, operating system. And they would need to validate the signatures. But there are not any actually deployed sub-resolvers that do this. So the uh, Microsoft um, sub-resolver in Windows um, is able to understand that they get DNSSEC signed resource records, but it's just not validated if the signature is actually valid. And this is the case with uh, Linux and BSDs as well. If you're running those operating systems, you can, of course, validate your uh, DNSSEC signature. But in Germany, you would then have the problem that, for example, the Fritz boxes by R4M, typical home router in Germany, use the domain fritz.box. Um, if you use DNSSEC in your home environment on the client devices, you wouldn't be able to resolve fritz.box because it's just a bogus domain name. It's out of the actual hierarchy, so there is no signature for it. If you validate signatures, you won't get an answer, and you can't access your router anymore. So DNSSEC has problems. Um, then 10 years later, um, people actually thought, OK, what about encrypting the actual DNS? Like, make it all secure and encrypt what we put on the wire. Um, this grew out of the OpenBSC folks. But you may know folks from OpenBSD or have heard how they work. They're not really standards guy. They just implement stuff and see, think it's secure, and say, yeah, well, we've got a solution. Use our solution. That worked with OpenSSH, but this only worked because some people at IETF actually thought, OK, well, we use your implementation for our standard because it's the best. Um, with DNSSEC, it never got any track record. Um, so DNSSEC, uh, DNSCrypt, is no IETF standard. Nobody uses this out there. You can go to the DNSCrypt um, website, download a client, um, make it work, and have uh, encrypted DNS. But if you use this, you can only talk to a really, really few uh, name servers, because the name server has to support this as well. 
So if you're running OpenBSD on your own server somewhere in the network, you can ru then run a DNS script capable name server. Yeah, that's, that's not going to work on your laptop. Or think about your grandma. Is she going to do this? No. Um, so the IATF got a wake-up call by these Snowden revelations in uh, 2013. And they actually made a standard that says that pervasive monitoring by state actors uh, should be uh, um, taken like an attack. So anybody working on IETF protocols should implement upcoming protocols in a way that you can't do that kind of pervasive monitoring that the Snowden revelations revealed. Um, and one of the first things the IETF thought about was DNS, because DNS was one of the last protocols that at that time was still completely unencrypted. So they really uh, quickly uh, started um, a working group to solve that. That was the DNS private exchange, DeepRive. Um, DeepRive came up with DNS over D uh, TLS. So we've got this really, really nice encryption protocol, TLS. We've got a lot of really good or really weird uh, implementation for T T TLS, but any operating system out there supports this. So why not just encapsulate the DNS traffic in TLS and put it on the wire? Then it's encrypted and nobody can complain. And this kind of works. So. If you're using DOT, it is actually encrypted. Nobody in the middle can see what you're asking a name server. But the thing is, the traffic can still be monitored because the actual standard says that you must use port 853, just like you must use port 80 for HTTP. Um, there's no way around it. You can still see traffic on there. Um, and with this... Whenever you see traffic, you may be able to analyze or block it. So the easiest way to block DOT would be just to block the port, and nobody would be able to, well, ask for encrypted DNS answers, which is kind of lame. Um, so then there was DNS over HTTPS, DOH. Um, this was worked on after DOT. Um, and this was basically 